Welcome. Thank you for being with me today. Today, we are going to be talking about broken bone surgeries and iris changes. And I'm just, as we're waiting for other people to join us, because I think there will be more, I just want to take, take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Judith Cobb. I am a master herbalist, natural nutrition clinical practitioner, and a certified iridology instructor. And I've been in this industry now for 40 years. I know, it's a long time, 40 years. And uh, some of you I've known for a good chunk of that time as well. I have people that I'm very, very familiar with joining me on the webinar, so it's good to have you with me. I'm just also going to encourage you as we're getting started to hop on over to iridology.education. And if you haven't already done this, please get in there and do it. When you go there, there's gonna be a little pop-up box. It's going to ask you if you want to receive a downloadable iris map. Well, why wouldn't you if you're interested in iridology, right? Hop on over there, get registered. That will also add you to my email list, which will let me send you emails twice or three times a week, letting you know when we have free iris trainings happening. So please take advantage of that opportunity, iridology.education. Now, as we get started here today, the, I'm going to start off on almost a negative note, okay, and that might not be the smartest thing to do, but there's been a lot of misconceptions about iridology, and they're perpetrated by people who've been trained in old ways that have been disproved, and that's a challenge because as an iridologist, that gives every single one of us a bad name, right? People who are using old things that don't work, that have been disproved, and they continue on in that vein, it doesn't do us any good. We know, um, and I'm, I'm party to some of this, that iridology is undergoing continual research. We're learning new things all the time, and it's really important for us to keep up to date with the latest information and the best information. Do you agree with that? That the best way for us to move a science forward is to stay up to date and to be adding to the research? Hi, Rosalind, good to see you on Instagram. Thanks for being there with me. I'm, I want us to have a conversation about this as we're looking at some at various slides today of eyes and of x-rays and of surgeries and things like that. And I would love it if you would post comments and questions, regardless of what platform you're on. I'm doing my best to monitor Facebook. So if you're commenting on Facebook, I might miss it because we are streaming into two locations on Facebook. But it's certainly if uh, make your comments and I'll come to them later. Those of you who are on the webinar and on Instagram with me, feel free to post questions and comments as we go. All right, let's have that conversation and make sure that this stuff is landing squarely for you. Um, and again, we will make sure at the very end that we get to any questions that we might have missed in the interim. So please play with me in my sandbox. Alrighty, let's go back to the slides for those of you who are on Instagram. There we go. This is where we're at. Uh, I'm going to put in a little tiny commercial plug here for the next start date of the course Dynamic uh, Iridology Assessment System. It is starting on October 7th. If you already know that you want this course, because some of you have been hanging out with me for a while, you might actually be waiting for this course to start, hop on over to iridology.education slash course dash info, get yourself registered for the course. Um, if you're new to me or you're just starting out, look uh, looking for an iridology course that will prepare you for certification, then I'm going to invite you, and this is short notice for you because it's happening tonight, invite you to join me for a webinar that is happening tonight where we're going to talk about the course, about who it's for, about what it's all about, about um, uh, who will benefit from it, how it will help you if you're a holistic practitioner, how it will help your clients if you're a holistic practitioner. Now, if you're with me on Instagram, and if you um, want the link for tonight, send me a DM, and I'll send you the link. If you're with me on Facebook and you need the link for tonight, 5 p.m. tonight, send me a DM. Again, this is an info session tonight at 5 p.m. Mountain Time to just go over the details of the course help you understand who will benefit from it because I, it's not for everybody, right? It's not for everybody. Who will benefit from it? How will you benefit? How will your clients benefit? Why do you wanna take this? 
So again, if you uh, are interested, DM me or PM me, depending what platform you're on, and let me know and I'll make sure you've got the link for tonight. Tonight, we're also going to be covering four specific things you can start doing right now that will help you in your holistic health practitioning business. So, you know, if you're interested in streamlining your business and really maximizing client care while you're spending a little less extra time doing things for your clients, join me tonight because we're going to work on that as well. Short, short little 10 second overview of who this course is designed for. It's for herbalists, nutrition, nutritionists, and naturopaths, then holistic practitioners in general, who wanna streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care so that they can stop working overtime to develop client programs and stop overwhelming your clients with programs that are just not manageable. We wanna do that because we want to increase our client success, we want to increase our, increase our client retention, and we want to also increase our client compliance. We wanna help our clients be more successful. That's what you can do with this dynamic iridology assessment system. If you wanna learn more than just iris markers, which is what so many social media sites are teaching, they're just teaching a one-to-one -one correlation of iris marker to symptom, which is really ineffective. If you wanna learn how the markers play off each other, how they interact, how they change your understanding of what's going on in the body. And if you wanna understand how to create programs, herbal programs or nutrition programs, using the eyes and using your client's input, your client's symptoms, then you really want to be with me tonight to learn more about the program. Again, I posted, for those of you on the webinar, I've posted the link for tonight in the comments, and uh, feel free to register for tonight's webinar there. The goal of Confident Nutritionist uh, Dynamic Iridology Assessment System, and it's Confident Nutritionist, not because we only do nutrition. We talk about herbs as well. And if you're into homeopathy or, or aromatherapy, we can integrate that as well. Um, it's to teach you how to use iridology confidently so that you can integrate it with what you already know and make help it integrate everything you already know. So to use iridology to pull in your nutrition, to pull in your homeopathy or your herbology or your lifestyle coaching or whatever, so that you can create those client programs very, very doably and help your clients achieve success. So um, any, if you've got any questions on that, feel free to post them and I will answer those as well. But let's look at how this works in a clinical setting. Let's, let's start with a little tiny background on iridology first, and that is the story of Ignaz von Petschle. And this is relevant to our topic today of iris changes. So we need to touch on this. The story goes that in the early 1800s, a little boy, an 11-year-old boy named Ignaz von Petschle, caught or found an owl or a hawk, and either the, the bird had a broken wing or a broken leg or it got broken while this young boy was trying to capture this animal. There's a lot of things that we really don't know about this story. And it says that Ignat saw a dark line form in the owl's eye or there was a dark line in the owl's eye. And as the, this bird was nursed back to health, this dark line disappeared. Now, here's the question we have now. A Couple of things. The first one is, this hasn't ever been reproduced. You think that with all of the wildlife and animal, wild animal shelters, wild bird shelters that are out there that are nursing these animals back to health, that some tech or some veterinarian would have been able to see a similar thing, right? Can't imagine this is the only wild bird in history that's had a broken limb and was nursed back to health in captivity, right? So hasn't been replicated. We also know that the human iris is a very different structure from an animal iris. And so it's highly unlikely that, that this would be relevant anyway. So hasn't been re replicated. We can't rely on it. What we are very grateful for though is that, that Ignatz, hi Camelia, good to see you on Instagram, is that Ignatz von Petschle um, had his curiosity peaked here. And he went on to develop one of the first iridology maps for humans that we ever worked with. So this is very cool that whatever he saw worked and it got him interested. Let's look at some eyes. Now, this is a very personal story and I don't usually tell highly personal stories. I usually tell stories about my clients, but this one is personal because it was me. 
And because I have the before and after and during photos that show this, all right? So this is what my iris looks like March 17th, 2017. Now, it's important here, you'll notice that we've noticed, noted the camera details, an f-stop of 6.3, a shutter speed of 1 over 16, an ISO of 800. Because different technical details like that can certainly change how an iris photo appears. So this is one of the challenges we have with people posting before and after photos that were taken with different equipment in different lighting is it's an invalid comparison. All right, and so I've noted the differences. Now we are specifically looking for some very specific, in a very specific area right here. This is the arm area if you're using the, the Ellen Tart Jensen map right down here, which I don't personally use, but she has an arm area and it shows up right here. Now this is March, 2017. My arm was perfectly fine. I never had a break never had a sprain, never had any damage to the arm whatsoever. So this is really important. Notice that we've got some fibers that are slightly hyper looking here. Um, notice that there's a little bit of a shaded gap in between them because this is important. Notice also the pupil size. This camera throws a bright light a bright LED light, which tends to bring the pupil size way, way down, which tends to then pull the fibers more straight. All right, so what, remember that, remember that, because March 13, 2019, my wrist did not normally look like this. I slipped on some ice, broke two bones in my wrist, ended up in the emergency room, and this was while I was waiting uh, to be seen, and, um, yeah, and all I could do was lay there and just support my arm on my chest because, oh my goodness, to move it was not fun. They uh, tried to set it doing an external reduction. They, thankfully, they knocked me out for that. I'm not usually one to say thank you for drugs, but oh my goodness, thank you for drugs. And so they knocked me out. They did an external reduction that was not successful. And this was the, the x-ray before they did the external. And you can see right here that your bones don't actually aren't supposed to have these sharp jagged points on them. That's one of the breaks, all right? So my husband watched the whole thing. He said he watched as they had residents and nurses pulling and yanking and massaging and pushing, someone holding my shoulder down, a couple of them pulling on my arm. Yeah, apparently it was pretty, pretty much a gong show. And so, um, and again, there's another break that shows up in here, but I do not know how to read x-ray, so I can't tell you exactly which one. Basically, it was the distal end of the ulna, uh, which was a commuted break, which apparently means that the bone had shifted and could not be properly lined up, and the, the distal end of the radius also, so there was two breaks in there. That's pre-surgery. This is what my arm looks like after surgery. Open reduction, they had to do two incisions to install two separate plates. So we're talking trauma here, okay? We've got a broken bone. We've got a double incision surgery. And what you're gonna see in a few minutes is all of the hardware that got installed. My fingers were so swollen, I could barely move them. I actually had to use my other hand to stretch and bend my fingers. Yeah, Camellia, ouch. Yeah, I was grateful for the cast. The cast made it so much more comfortable and um, pillows, lots of pillows to rest my arm on so I could keep it elevated. And, and anyway, thank goodness our bodies are meant to heal, give them the right tools and they do, right? So on March 19th, so this is like six days post-surgery, right? I had the presence of mind with one hand to set up my iridology camera and take iris photos. Oh my goodness, get a life, girl. Um, you'll notice that I didn't, didn't set my camera up exactly the same way. So we're a little bit washed out. The light is a little bit brighter. But I want you actually to look at what is going on over here. We've got the same hyper white fibers. We've got the same shaded area. There is no black line. There is no black line, right? Pupil is about the same size, maybe a little tiny 
bigger, which would be expected because by this point I was functioning in the parasympathetic mode, which means that you're responding to stress at quite a strong, a high level. And that makes your pupils go larger. So if my pupils didn't come down quite as far, that is to be expected. All right. This is what it looks like when I went two weeks later to get that cast removed and to get another cast on. Hmm. I'm pretty sure my DNA did not include two metal plates. And when we look at all this, it's a total of 12 screws. So think of all the trauma. Okay, we've got the double bone break. We've got two incisions for surgery. We've got two metal plates and 12 screws installed. Now, wouldn't you think that if the eyes were going to show changes, based on trauma, that it would be showing something. Wouldn't you think that? All right, well, let's, another view. Two weeks post-surgery again, you can see both of the plates clearly. You can see all of the screws in here. Yep, they call me bionic. I do not set off metal detectors yet, which is a good thing. The day they changed the cast out, this is what it looks like. This was the one incision for one of the plate installments. Healing very well, very well indeed. This is the one along the side of my arm where they installed the other plate. Okay, so um, things were healing nicely. My fingers were down to size and we'd gotten rid of all the sausages on my hands. And we have just a week or two later, the same camera settings as we did in the images that were two weeks post-op. And what we see here is we've got the very same hyper white fibers that we had two years before the incident. We've got the very same shading in between. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Not a single blessed thing has changed. So let's look at these images side by side. We've got the March 20th, 2017, so two years pre. On March 19th, we have a little brighter light, so the, the image looks brighter and looks a little washed out, but we've got the exact same markings, the exact same shading. Pupil is a little larger because I was a little bit parasympathetic, right, which is going to make the fibers look a little wobblier, a little wavier. Then again, a couple of weeks later, we redid them. They're right here. And the, the fibers have not moved. It's not that they've shifted down. It's that um, it's really hard to hold the camera on total level when you're doing it with one hand, right? And so that's why it looks like these fibers have maybe shifted down. They didn't shift. It's the positioning of the camera. And so again, we see, see that pupils coming down. Um, and if you recall, these last two images were done on the same camera settings. And so pupils coming down, which means I'm calming down. I'm not quite as parasympathetic in my response. And I'm kind of adapted to the fact that, yeah, I've got a broken wing for a while. Okay, now... Note the date, the 3rd of April. So we are two and a half, three weeks into healing here. Things are going good. That cast came off early May. And uh, I'm then on Mother's Day. <laughs> Mother's Day the same year. I can laugh now. Visiting my son for Mother's Day. Slipped on the stairs in his house. Landed on my left elbow was the left arm I broke before, landed on my left elbow and snapped the electronon right off. Grandchildren watching, did not say anything I should not say in front of my precious grandchildren. Bit my tongue and all I could do was lay there on the floor holding my arm and going, oh, oh, oh. Going into shock, coming mostly out of shock, and then deciding next course of action. Because it was Mother's Day, I was uh, dressed nicely. And I thought, I'm not going to the hospital dressed in my good clothes. They'll want to cut them off. 
So I made my husband bring me home. I made my husband and my daughter help me get changed into clothes that if they needed to cut them, it would not matter. And so, yes, I have my priorities. Here I am at the hospital. My elbow does not normally look quite like that. My husband said he watched as I laid on that floor holding my elbow. He said I knew something was wrong. I watched it uh, swell up. I watched it start to turn purple. I knew we'd done something bad. So here we are twice in a period of, oh, that's the wrong date here. It shouldn't be March because this was actually May, May 12th. My apologies, wrong date because it was Mother's Day 2019. Mother's Day 29 will go down in history. Had another surgery because you cannot repair an Electronon without installing hardware. And so this is me in my slab cast. And um, I discovered there that scrub tops are the best because they've got wide necks and loose sleeves and it's easy to put them on with one hand and they've got tons of pockets to put things in when you've only got one good hand and you've got to carry your phone and your car keys and maybe some chapstick and oh yeah, maybe you've got to bring a can of soup up from the storage room kind of thing, right? So I went and bought some scrub tops. May 27th, 2019, so about 15 days after the break and after surgery. So not quite as on the ball this time because I waited two weeks. But again, you would think that if a break that serious was going to show up, we would see not just the regular uh, hyperlines we'd seen before, not just the regular shading we'd seen before, but you would think that we would see a black line in between. So with three broken bones in about two months, you'd think something would show up, wouldn't you? But nothing did. You'd think that with all the hardware, we're gonna look at the hard, all the hardware again in just a moment, you'd think that something would show up, wouldn't you? But nothing did. So what does this tell us? It tells us that iridology reflects our inherent structure, not our our altered structure, right? If you have plastic surgery on your cheekbones, or if you have reconstructive surgery on a badly mangled hand or on, a, on an arm, it's not gonna show up in your eyes. So um, we were glad to see that that impact did not dislodge anything here. Here is the picture of the hook and the wire that is in my elbow that is held it together so that it would reattach properly. September 2nd, 2019 thought, okay, if maybe there's a delayed reaction. Maybe things take a while to show up. They don't. The same bright fibers, the same bit of shading, exactly the same. So my conclusion from this is that breaks and surgeries and traumas do not re reflexly show up in the iris because breaks and traumas and surgeries don't change our genetic structure. Now, I'm here to tell you my arm is really, really well healed. I have a brilliant physiotherapist and I was religiously dedicated to doing absolutely everything he told me to do. And as he said, it's rare with an Olecranon break to get full mobility back. Um, but I have like 99% extension and it, with the broken wrist as well, he said, yeah, probably not going to get all that back. And I probably got like 95 to 98% recovery there as well. They're not quite as strong as I want them, but full mobility, full, full range of motion, which is really great. So my arm is beautifully healed up. And even now I continue to work on it and lift weights and do things to strengthen it. I'm also going to tell you that even though I'm a herbalist and, a, and a, a nutrition coach, I am very grateful for modern medicine. I'm grateful that um, we had such fabulous medical doctors. I, I actually did the great my MD to check the doctors who did my surgery the first time and the second time, and they both have like five stars, which I'm like so grateful for that. Um, and I'm thankful for my all star physiotherapist. And I'm also thankful that for what I know, because I did 
launch heavily into the herbs and the supplements. And when the casts came off, I really worked with essential oils on the incisions to help the scars heal more, more um, with, with less scar tissue and just more solidly. And now you can almost not see them. The scars are very, very thin lines. They're, they've healed beautifully. So Bill Caradonna, who is my, one of my favorite teachers in constitutional iridology, said this, modern iridology can't explain the owl story. Von Petschley's story from a very long time ago has not been reproduced, so it's just a waste of time to repeat it. It just creates confusion. Critical thinking is required when applied to any topic. Now, we do see that there is the possibility of some change in the eyes when there is trauma, but it's not in the iris unless it's actually an eye injury. So for example, this marking here, this blood vessel that splits into two, it splays very nicely into two with one very graceful branch and one branch that's a little, a little um, less heavy, if you will, not quite as robust and a little bit more wobbly, not quite as smooth, is what is known as a trauma fork. Now a trauma fork often shows us where there has been a significant physical trauma. And um, so where the crotch of the fork is, if we draw a line straight into the eye and look at the reflex areas in the eye there, it tells us where the trauma or the impact was, how wide the arms reach tells us, how broad the impact, how broadly the impact affected the person. Now this was a girl, who um, at the time of this photo was 17. She was in grade 11. And a fellow in her school, I, I, I choose my words carefully because this makes me very angry. A young man in her school decided it would be very funny to hit her in the head with a very one of the Harry Potter books hardcover, and it was the really thick one. I don't know the Harry Potter books well. And he hit her on the corner of her head. So he hit her right on the corner of her head. And it was actually, it was on the left side of her head. Very, very hard. And it gave her a concussion. Like we're talking a concussion that nearly cost her the school year. Um, she had to have readers for exams. She had to help have tutoring to help her get through the year. And when we look at where this trauma fork is, it came up exactly on that, that corner. Now, this image was actually taken about a year after the impact. And what that tells us, because the sclera is very dynamic, and, and you know this, if you've ever had a good hard cry, you know how it gets bloodshot, how the blood vessels get really engorged and, and ugly and messy. That's why we call it an ugly cry, right? One of the reasons. But, you know, an hour or two later, things calm down. And so we see that in this sclera as well, that the that with something like this where it's a sudden impact that blood vessel can come up fairly quickly and as the healing happens the blood vessel will regress now the fact that this blood vessel has not did not disappear over the course of a full year means that there is residual damage okay now she's very functional she finished she did her grade 12 the next year she's gone off to college she's doing beautifully so while there is still some residual damage she is very functional she's bright she's smart she's um you know she's got it together so the residual damage is at this point in time not having a negative impact for her which is exciting very exciting here's another example of a trauma fork in another client so this is the kind of marking that immediately after the trauma, this can be very bright and very bold. And as the healing happens, this can settle. It'll become less intense. May never go away, but it might also go away. So whether it does or not depends on the extent of the damage and what was done to help with the healing. With this 17 year old, her mother was vigilant uh, with everything from the dark room and the not moving and all of that, you know, just really vigilant with following all of the current research to the letter to help her daughter heal. 
Alrighty, so just as we are getting ready, ready to wrap up again, just wanted to know, are there any questions, any comments? I always find that really interesting to talk about um, the changes that we actually don't see and changes we can see as a result of a trauma or a physical impact. Again, if you, um, if you already know that and you've been with me for a while and you know you want to do the 40 hour long iridology course that will prepare you for certification hop on over to iridology.education slash course dash info but again if you um, are new to me if you have not heard about the course and you're interested and you just want to know details to see if this could possibly be a good fit for you, then hop on over if you're on the webinar to the link that I've posted there. For those of you on Instagram, I will um, DM me, send me a DM and I will send you the link if you'd like to join us at five o'clock mountain time tonight to learn more about this upcoming iridology course. And if you're on Facebook, um, PM me there and let me know that you would like to receive the link and I will give it to you there. So thank you so much for being with me today. I hope that that was helpful. I'm not seeing any questions or any chat come in. So I hope that was helpful. I hope that gave you some good insight that shows you that the idea that we can use the iris, the eye rides to monitor changes, to monitor health improvements is bohunk and old information that is not valid. But I hope it also showed you that we can use the sclera to monitor uh, both breakdowns in the health and improvements in the health. So I look forward to seeing you tonight, hopefully at 5 p.m. Mountain Time, and uh, look forward to seeing you again real soon on a live event. And Camelia on um, Instagram Live is saying, thanks, you are most welcome. Thank you for being with me today. And thank you for joining me on the webinar. And thank you for joining me on Facebook. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now.